Welcome to the Unriveted Podcast, where we dial in on technology intersections of digital transformation, artificial intelligence, and people. Our goal with this podcast is to talk about topics that John and I have a lot of passion about, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the modernization of process automation. Hey, John, what are we going to talk about today? Hey, Martin. Thank you for the introduction, as always. Uh, today, we have a very special guest on Unriveted. We're joined by Stephen Griffin, Director of Site Reliability Engineering at Achievers. Uh, and we're going to have a conversation about what he does there and, and kind of how it pertains to the greater data and AI ecosystem. Hello. How are you guys? Very good. Thank you for joining us. No problem. Glad to be invited. This is great. Do so you want to uh, get us started, uh, Stephen, and, sure. and just give us kind of a walkthrough of, of kind of what you do at Achievers, you know, your experience in SRE, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, my name is Stephen Griffin. I am the Director of Site Reliability Engineering at Achievers. Uh, in case anyone doesn't know what Achievers is, it's a recognition platform, employee experience retention platform for companies to buy and be able to make employees happy. Um, my team consists of roughly 20 people, uh, and we have been on a very large journey from a monolith on-prem data center type of application to microservices and cloud and all the cool stuff and all the cool terms everybody loves to hear. And we are currently still in the journey. We started about two and a half years ago. So it's been a real interesting experience, you know, starting it. The team was very small at the time. The team, team consisted of like four people. And now we're up to 20 um, as we have grown as a company and also as we've grown our infrastructure and our microservices world applications. Excellent. What are some of the uh, steps or processes that you went through to, I would say, just to get it started and, and then progression of that? One was deciding what was the right solution, I think was the biggest challenge like we knew we had to change our, our our platform we we were well aware we were growing at a very rapid rate our monolith is very large um and it's just running data centers wasn't feasible anymore and we knew growing globally that would also be a challenge and i think the first decision that we made was what cloud vendor to use i think that was the first step who are we going to go with who has the best technology, you know, and the technology that fits what we want to go. And I think, you know, you know, we, we, we evaluate every vendor, the three main ones, those are AWS and Google. And we knew we wanted to do Kubernetes. That was hands down. That's where we're going. That's the, that's the future. You can hire good people. Everybody wants to do that. And so we did, that was one. Two was the networking because we knew you know, the way our architecture worked, especially on the database layer was low latency was key. We knew we needed that. We knew we were going to need it for the future. And so we did a lot of POCing. Uh, it was me and three other people deciding who we were going to use. We tried different vendors. How easy was it to automate? That was the other thing too. Automation was key. Like we didn't want to do manual work anymore because the non-prem data center is manual work. So um, that was that was hard. That was the biggest decision that we made. And it took, a, I would say, six months for us to really come to a decision of what vendor to use. And we did decide on picking Google. Um, and that was the right choice for us. Latency was huge. I mean, the, the Google network is one of the best I've ever seen. Um, you know, we needed data, low database latency between you know, regions and zones and stuff of that nature, which was, it was just key. And obviously, there. They were, they're the forefront of Kubernetes. They, they invented it. So, you know, we knew that we would get the best support. We would get the latest technology. And I think that's, that's, that was the first step. And I think that really helped us get started and really start moving and build that relationship with the vendor and start moving slowly into that world. And that's kind of how we started. Interesting. And in this journey, did you also consider any isolation using, um, infrastructure as code uh, templatized tool to oh, yeah. protect you. Yep, that worked. Absolutely. We, we really needed to automate 
as much as possible. Like I am, I'm pretty much against clicking the UI. Uh, I don't think it's click ops is not my world. I, I've never enjoyed it, and I don't want to be that way. I want to be able to repeat as much as possible and recover fast. And we decided on Terraform. Uh, we kind of already had someone who had a good Terraform experience to start with, so I think that really helped. And you know, Terraform was the player. And I still think it is. I mean, cloud formation is pretty cool. Um, but we just stuck with Terraform and, you know, we, we learned it. We all learned it. I think that was the biggest thing we had, you know, like I said, I had a team of about four people at the time. Nobody knew Terraform. I mean, one person did, but no one else. I didn't, never used it, but, you know, we're like, all right, let's get our hands dirty and let's start figuring out how we're going to do this and automate as much as we can and repeat as much as we can. And I think, you know, building out the global networking of our cloud vendor was the first step in figuring out how to do permissions and then figuring out how we're going to net, how we're going to do egress, how we're going to do ingress, how we're going to do BPCs. I think that was the key part of trying to figure out, you know, that was a great learning step. It took us months to really build that. And then once we figured that part out, then we started building out, okay, let's start getting the clusters up and running. How do we connect? How do we how do we get developers to start putting their features there? You know, building features, I should say, or starting up microservices. How, where do we start? And I think that's where, you know, again, learning. The vendor, Google helped. You know, we had a lot of cool ideas where we wanted to go. And I think Google has a group, I created a great relationship with us. I can't specify how good, you know, how good it was, uh, how good it is, I should say. But, you know, they really helped us get us, put it off the ground, teach us what we, you know, kind of give us some ideas and kind of go for it. I have a lot of experienced people that work for me. I've worked known them for almost 20 years, almost as of you know this year. And that really helped to really start moving things pretty quick because we all knew each other and knew how we worked. And, you know, and we're both, we're all go-getters. We're those are like, all right, let's put our heads down and let's start writing. Interesting. The move from on-prem to, to GCP, did mm -hmm. you refactor your code base? And what is your code base written in? Our, our code base, our monolith is written in PHP. Uh, so it's a simple LAMP stack at the end of the day, my PHP and my SQL. Um, but our, our microservices world is Python and Go. Uh, so, and we have, I mean, when we started the microservices journey, you know, we had nothing. Um, but our monolith is, it's large. It's a large PHP application. <laughs> um, but we, what we did was we did a lift and shift. We, we made some changes where we needed to, you know, message queuing pops up, you know, we, we implemented that. We made some changes to how we talked to MySQL. You know, we made some easy changes that we could. And then there were some hard changes and hard development, a lot of development work to make some things work a little differently, not how they worked in the data center. So, because we had to do regions, we had to go to multiple regions, we had to do data residency. So we had a lot of things that we had to consider with the monolith to make it work better. So we didn't make that investment on the development side, but from the microservices world, um, we, we started from scratch. So we started fresh, uh, Canvas is the word I'm looking for. Uh, and, you know, we start, what do, what do we want to go? What's the best tools? What's the best code? What's the best languages? And that's where we started. And we picked Python and Go because that's pretty much where everybody is these days. And you can get talent. And I think that was the other key, too, because we were still, we're still, we were still a decent-sized engineering organization. I mean, we're almost 130 developers in development. If you include SRE, it's about 130-ish. That's a big engineering department, but when we started, we were, let's say, seventy, maybe eighty. You know, so you know, I think that you know, to get the talent that we needed, I think we had to pick something that everybody wants to do. Excellent, John. Um, you know, we we've talked about observability. You know, it seems like I, I've been monopolizing the Q and A here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll jump in there. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, specifically, I guess about. Um, you know, my background is in machine learning and, and data science, uh, so it's tangential, I suppose, to something uh, in the SRE world. Obviously, those services can't exist without the support of an SRE or a team uh, of people in that uh, capacity. But, uh, you know, Martin and I always are interested in understanding kind of the tools and techniques that people are using to monitor um, those systems and in terms of observability, right? If we don't know what's going on inside the black box, uh, which we typically 
you know, we typically use that phrase to talk about machine learning models that are highly complex, like artificial neural networks. But uh, you could, you know, you could say a black box technically covers a lot of different bases within the IT world. So interesting, you know, your experience, uh, either positive or negative in how you've treated monitoring both prior uh, to moving to GCP when you were still using kind of on-prem uh, servers uh, as opposed to what you do now in GCP, the trade-offs, uh, the pros, the cons, are there any special tools you use outside of GCP's own built-in tools and uh, kind of your experience with that? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, when we were on-prem, we used Davix quite heavily. I implemented it. Sometimes I, I get upset that I did that, um, but we use Zabbix uh, and we really pushed Zabbix to its limits. Uh, it was, it worked for what it needed to do, but it was very noisy. We knew that's not what we were going to use in GCP. We knew that from the start. We were already a new relic customer. We used APM browser monitoring, all the good stuff. We just never really got into infrastructure hosts. I mean, as you know, I know Martin's used New Relic, and there's always New Relic at the beginning had a lot of challenges when it came to infrastructure hosting. The tool wasn't that great, but they did make improvements over the last few years, and we decided that was good enough for us to use. We knew we did not want to use GCP's monitoring tools. Um, they were very slow, hard to kind of understand um, from a simple developer world, and not the easiest thing to automate. Auto it is possible to automate, it just wasn't as easy. So we decided New Relic is where we're going. Uh, and we implemented New Relic for all our monitoring, every infrastructure host, every service, every, even the, the, the monolith does all its monitoring, um, its application monitoring through New Relic, browsing and all that stuff. So the same thing applies to our microservices world because it's a full, it's a separate platform from the end user point of view. And that's, we went that direction and it was a great, it's a great investment. I mean, New Relic has been an absolutely fantastic partner with us. And we did have to do evaluations of whether or not New Relic was the right tool. We did look at Datadog. Um, you know, there was some interesting tools. The log, search, the log searching feature of Datadog was a really cool feature. Um, but their APM integration was not great. Their browsing integration, not great. And New Relic just had the better tool. And we already had the relationship, so we decided to go that way. And then as we got into observability, microservices, that's where I think New Relic really shines. You know, it gathers a ton of data, which can be a downfall for some <laughs> when it comes to a cost thing, something to keep control of. But we, um, you know, it definitely gives us a more broad range of what's in the black box, what's happening in the black box. Because we do run Istio in-house. Uh, we don't use Google's version, uh, which, again, is cool. It's really cool stuff, but we need to know what's going on because we have a very large service mesh that talks between multiple regions and they all do a bunch of stuff. One has to talk to another and be able to talk to databases. So we uh, we need to know what's going on. And New Relic gives us that visibility and the latency between apps, which is key to our, for us to build the right platform. The machine learning thing, um, <laughs> you know, we just started getting our hands a little bit into machine learning. We have a data science team that does quite a bit of that on the, on their own as they're trying to build what recognition models or, you know, uh, other things that can, that can apply to our customers to help them, you know, improve their experience. But we have built one service that uses somewhat of a mach machine learning model, which is called uh, relevancy, which is basically like the, uh, the idea of um, having a customized feed of what you're, who are you interacting with and who are you recognizing? What do you want to see based on your actions within the platform? Something we've never done before. And, you know, that was a really cool thing that we were able to build fast because we were in cloud. Mm -hmm. I think that was one of the, you know, a good ROI to opportunity to show was, you know, we were in the data center and we were running what we were running back, you know, in the data centers and the Nutanix cluster, a lot of hardware, to build something of that model and be able to host it and manage it and be able to do all the resourcing required for it would have taken months, if not, you know, especially, you know, in 2021, when we started 2020, early 2022, when we started building it, um, it would have been months of just procurement, trying to get hardware. 
So I think that, you know, it really shows the value of when you do cloud and how to do it right, what you can get out of it if you have mm-hmm. everything in place to move quick. Gotcha. Excellent. Excellent. So John has heard me say this before, and I usually say it in a forum when it's my own team, but, you know, I, I kind of share it at how I wake up every morning and each day and every day I think about what I can do today to make tomorrow better. And, you know, Stephen, you, you and I both <laughs> share some common path with SRE, and that actually should resonate with SRE because it's just one step at a time. And, and sometimes you take two steps and sometimes you slide back and you take a, four, a bunch of steps. But what you're doing is you're trying to prevent recurring incidents. You're trying to prevent just churn of wasted time and, you know, solving problems quickly. Yeah. I. Uh... <laughs> You know, I I wake up every morning and I think about, you know, one, I think about my team. How can I make my team's life easier? Because our goal as an SRE isn't to be the bottleneck. I don't want to be the bottleneck. I want feature teams and developers to be able to do what they need to do with the tools that are required to do their job in a secure way. There's security. There's understanding and what your what your application is doing and i never think we have enough tools to cover all that so what other tool can we look at building today what other um feature can we look at implementing in sre department to you know make it more manageable um you know we're we're moving to gatekeeper for uh pot security um now we're trying to figure out what our policies are going to be and you know do we really want to be the policy holder you know, should that go to the DevSecOps team? And I think, you know, there are certain things we should hold, but I don't think there's not everything. I don't want to be the manager, but I also don't want to slow down development either. So those are just examples of like what I'm currently thinking about, you know, and we we build a lot of tools in-house. I think that when we started our journey, we wanted a self-serving tool for developers. We, hey, you got a microservices microservice, here is your template. This is everything you need. You need pups up, you need a bucket, you need permissions, you need Redis, you need, you know, data flow, mm-hmm. whatever. This will prov- this will give you what you need, simple YAML statement, you know, see YAML code and just put in things and let it run and it will deploy your service in the correct way and the configuration done for you. Um, and in-house we call it abattoir. Uh, slaughter. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> and then we have cows and as our, as our Kubernetes clusters, uh, <laughs> it's, it's cool. <laughs> but, you know, we really want to be able to give that, that power to developers and give them the ability to do that. And we've spent a lot of time as an SRE team doing that and trying to make mm-hmm. our lives a lot easier too, because we don't want to be setting up buckets and we don't want to be setting up, you know, Redis clusters. We just want them to be able to do what they, they can do. I think the bigger challenge for us in the future is going to be our databases. They are, um, they're very complex. Uh, and right now we are focusing on the application side for microservices at some point, And we are starting that process of what do we put in database Kubernetes? What do we do? And I think that's, um, it's a really cool challenge and a really cool thing to be working on trying to figure out how do we do this? I mean, you know, it's a lot different in Kubernetes than it is running a VM clustering of MySQL or Mongo or Postgres. So I think that's that's the next step in our evolution from my side, from the SRE side of like, okay, we've got the application sorted out, developers on a good path. How do we do it with databases? You know, because that that's what we, I own that, my team owns that. So we have to figure out how we're going to manage it. Because I think, you know, Every mi- I don't think every microservice should have a database, but I think a domain should. And we have domains with 10 services under each. I think every domain should have a set of databases to run their services and manage it by their fee- by that domain's team. That's where I think our path will be. But we just have to figure out what's the right tool to build and how we create it more of, here you go, here's your self-tool. You want a MySQL cluster? There you go. You want a Postgres cluster? There you go. And with all the security and all the permissions and the users and the password resets and all that type of stuff is our next challenge going down the road of getting rid of the monolith application. Excellent. 
this um, this sounds like this was a good place for us to do a wrap. And on behalf of Unriveted, we're so happy to have had you as a guest today, Stephen. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this will be interesting to watch uh, this back when we when we complete it. And for everybody out there that's listening, remember to click that like button. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.